Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sermon Notes, uh, our, our weekly session where Matt, Jared, and myself here at Taylor's Valley Baptist Church get a chance to sit down and go a little bit deeper into yesterday's sermon. Um, right now we're in the Apologia sermon series where, where Jared begins to talk a little bit deeper about some things, some questions of the faith, uh, uh, Apologia being in defense of the faith. Uh, and so we get a chance to, to go through some pretty weighty topics. Yesterday being maybe one of the most weighty, one of the, the questions that, that we get as ministers maybe more often than, than anything else at times, um, is, is how could a good God allow suffering and evil? Uh, that was the title of the sermon series. And, and, and as we begin to talk and as we've been discussing a little bit, uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that because um, one of the interesting parts about Jared's sermon was that that, that was the sermon title, but, but one of the things that, that he discussed as he goes, there was a question or, or a statement that he brought up. He said that uh, this sermon was about five reasons that I believe God exists even though suffering and evil exist. Some great points, some, some great discussion topics, um, and, and as we dive in a little bit further, I think I would really like to hear a discussion about how could a good God allow suffering and evil, because I think that, that, that some of the things in, our, in your sermon, um, in, in, in not, to, not to be critical, I mean, I, I enjoyed the sermon, but were, were they were, they, they were about how I reconcile the fact that there is God and there is, is suffering, but maybe not necessarily bringing those two thoughts together. Um, and, and so I kind of wanted to dive into that just a tad about how could a good God allow suffering and evil? Well, I, th I think that even to have a rational conversation about this, there is the admission that suffering and evil are, in some sense, that there's something wrong with the world, okay? And I don't think that you can say something is wrong with the world unless the world is made for something. If humans are made for something, and if the world is made for something, then I think you can say that something's wrong with it. Uh, but that, in my view, admits to a design, a purpose, a telos, uh, a goal for the world. And uh, so I don't even think you can have a rational conversation about this. I go back to the moral argument, you know, if God does not exist, moral facts do not exist. Moral facts do exist, therefore God exists. You know, if if there's not such a thing as morality, then why would we even have a conversation about evil uh, if we don't have some reference point, some basis to have that conversation? So I, I think even, you know, to have a conversation about this, uh, there is this assumption that there is a God. And so, yes, in a sense, really yesterday, I focused more attention on how to reconcile, assuming God does exist, how do we reconcile uh, the existence of a good uh, benevolent God with all the evil and suffering that we observe in the world. It is a very emotional topic. And I identify, quoted uh, Stephen Fry yesterday at the beginning, I identify with his uh, disgust with all the evil and suffering in the world. We should be disgusted that kids have bone cancer and, and things of this nature. That This is wrong. This is objectively uh, something that is not good. And so how do we reconcile all that with a good and loving God? And so that's really where I tried to focus my attention yesterday is why I believe God is good even though suffering and evil exist. Well, I, I think it's interesting, you know, that, that we talk about that. And, and I think as, as Christians, um, it is, it, with our belief in God, I think it is our... I don't know if it's our responsibility, but I, th I think we, we need to at least attempt. You, you, I, I enjoyed the thought about Fry, but my favorite part that you brought up, one of the things that I think has to be discussed at least, um, and you'll forgive me, I think it was a philosopher, but I'm not positive, that you said, um, uh, you quoted, if God is good, then he's not all-powerful. If yeah. God is all-powerful, then he's not good. Um, because of the existence of suffering, because of the existence of evil. And so I think that's the thing is, and I think it's our chance. I think this is a great opportunity for us to talk about um, uh, evil, um, bone cancer in children, blindness that happens to innocent people, things like that. This is, this, these are some of the questions I think that when people ask us, this is a great opportunity to, to, to tell the, the dozens of viewers that we will have, um, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe some of our thoughts. How do yeah. we answer those questions? And so maybe that's, maybe that's a great starting point, Matt, is, is, is it, when, when someone comes to you, when a youth comes to you, and they want to ask that question, how do you answer that question? Well, I say it's lunchtime, and let's go. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, that's, that's a difficult question, and there, it, it takes a lot of 
um, the finding of terms to speak intelligently about it. I think an approach with youth is going to be different than an approach with, say, a, an adult with a philosophy degree, you know? And I think a lot of our arguments that we try, we take from these philosophy departments and we bring them down to our level and we try to, you know, mer uh, you know ferret them out is not something that my kids are going to understand. And so I want to make it understandable, yet I don't want to burden them over much. You know, I like uh, Corey Ten Boom and her dad, you know, getting on the train and, you know, there's a, there's a dad or there's a guy and a gal like really kind of hot and heavy with each other and she's like hey dad what's you know what is sex or something like that and he's like well hey pick up my suitcase and you take it and put it over there and she's like i can't it's too heavy he's like well there are some things that are too heavy right now that we can't you know that we can't get into and so as a circular way of me saying i think with youth you need to approach it with it's good that you notice that there's something wrong and kind of like how Jared said, what are we made for? What's the telos? What's the end of, you know, where, where we're going? And just like a train can only go so far on its own tracks, if you jump off its tracks, it's going to not go very far and it's going to look like a disaster. You know, God has outlined this plan that's good, yet we don't follow it. How that all works together, that's going to be a much more in-depth conversation. Um, but I can tell you that we trust God for these reasons. I can tell you that he's a God of love for these reasons, why these things happen, I can't tell you. And so with a youth, that's the way I would approach it. Now, as they got older, I think we would tease out some of these more complex you know, questions. And, th you know, the thing is, these questions have been asked for millennia, you know, for thousands and thousands of years. People have been asking if the gods are good, you know, why does this happen? And Plato and all these philosophers all right. have tried to answer, and they haven't. Yeah. I wanted to go back to what you mentioned earlier, the philosopher, the Greek philosopher named Epicurus, and basically what he says is that he kind of sets this up in this way. He says, if God is willing to prevent evil, but not able, then he is not all-powerful. If God is able to prevent evil, but not willing, then he is not good. But if he is both willing and able, how can evil exist? If he is neither able nor willing, why call him God? And I think of those, I, th I think that, you know, when he says, for example, if God is able to prevent evil but not willing, then he's not good. Well, that would assume that there wouldn't be any good reasons to have a world with suffering in it. And uh, I think that any time a parent takes their kid to the dentist, they know that there's a decent chance they're going to have some suffering, uh, but it serves a, a better purpose in the long run. So that, that's kind of a small example. Uh, but why would we think that God wouldn't have any good reasons for suffering? I mentioned yesterday the millions of people in China who have come to know God and to have a relationship of, with God. Uh, and in part due to suffering. Over the course of human history, suffering has actually advanced the cause of God's kingdom, and people have come to know God and uh, received eternal life. And, you know, if there's nothing better than God, and if suffering moves us and motivates us to turn to God in faith, then I would think that God does have a good reason to allow suffering. But even beyond that, uh, I mentioned this just a little bit yesterday. There's the free will defense, uh, which says that, you know, maybe it's logically impossible for God to create a world of free, uh, of people that have free will who just always choose to do what's good. Uh, maybe that's logically impossible for that to happen. And uh, so I think there's good reasons to think that that, that premise is false uh, to say if God is able to prevent evil but not willing, then he's not good. Okay, so there's going to be suffering, there's going to be evil, but God very well could have good reasons for it. And we're just not in any, we, we just don't have the vantage point to be able to answer that question in our own limited, finite human minds. And um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. I, I really liked how you started off in your sermon by, you know, I am in no position to judge God. I mean, because that's, in essence, that's the reality is we as human, finite human beings can't judge an infinite God, but we can see what good is and what bad is, and we have been given that innate ability. And so <clears throat> one of the, the areas I think all three of us hit in different directions, as you said, 
you don't think it's lo- it might not be logically possible. You know, and we're, we're talking about the mites and the ifs and the buts now. But you said that it might not. I think that it's completely logically possible, and God could do it. But I think God did it for the, a special reason. I think he created this earth with the suffering that's in it specifically for a reason. Now, we can, we can argue about what that is, and we can also argue, is that what God did? Did he create a world with just free will, and that's the fault of, you know, free will is what caused all the problems. Or did God create this earth knowing that we're going to act this way, or did he create it with this, in, this plan in mind? And, I mean, I, I don't mind going into that, that direction. Um, in just one area, I think John Frame answers it really well. That's why I have his book here. Um, it was for another class, but then, it, you know, same time, same topic, same time. And he talks about how God is a personal God, and goodness is reflected in his personal aspect with us. And I thought that was an interesting approach um, because we, so often we think of goodness as this, like, big thing, but I'm good to my children, but I may not be so good to someone breaking into my house, you know, and I think we, we look at God and say, oh, well, God is good all the time to everyone, all the same, and maybe maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, I think it, the, the free will, it's interesting that the, the, the idea of goodness and, and free will, I, I think they play together um, because we talk about that, and we, and we say that because if I were to create a world where, if I was God and I were to create a world where um, everybody had free will, I allowed you to have free will. Is it feasible that, that, that it's perfect? Because here's the thing. When we talk about that, when we talk about goodness, I mean, um, what is good for me may not necessarily be good for you guys. So a decision that I make in my own free will doesn't mean it has to be evil. It can be evil. I mean, I can make the decision to kill Matt. That's obviously not going to be good for Matt. Right. But, but there may be a decision that is good for me that is Might not be good, good for, for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and so I, I, but I think that that's, yeah. that's something to tease out, though, it, yeah. it is that, that even within free will is I don't have to be evil for you to feel ill effects. Doesn't mean that there's not evil. Doesn't mean there's not a fourth member that may, uh, of this panel that may wind up being evil himself and just trying to do harm because we see that. We, we've seen that play out through history. There are people, even if they think that they have good intentions, um, who just do flat out evil to other people. And, and yet, it, are we robots if we have to do the, 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 this one thing every single time, are we even human at that point, I guess, is a good question. And, and why, here's my other question, I mean, because obviously we have lots of questions and very few answers, but why do we have to, do we think that we deserve God's goodness? You know, why do we think that God has to be good to all of us the same? I mean, you know, he, he promises certain things, he's a creator, but that doesn't mean that he always needs to be good. And I think that's, that's the, the definition thing comes up there. Yeah. Is, is when we talk about why, why does he have to be good? And, 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 and it is because you, you have to bring up the thought of, sorry, I know I cut you off here. No, that's fine. Um, it, but, you know, what does good mean? Yeah. Because that's the thing. Because we do. We say God is love. I mean, we read in First John, God is love. Yeah. Um, and, and so if we say that, but you're right, is, is what does goodness mean to each person? Because I think a lot of times, too, we define goodness by our own sense of goodness. And I think this is where a lot of your points come in from yesterday, yeah. is the fact that it, it's it's not necessarily my ideas of goodness. Because my ideas of goodness, I'm going to tell you right now, my ideas of goodness are driving a big truck that's already paid off, having a big house that's already paid off, having kids that go to the best schools that never get bullied, that never get a B, that never get a D, that, that, that everything is fair, Your everything is great, everything is, you know what I'm saying? Yes. I mean, that's my idea of goodness. And, and, and I think that's where we begin to have definition problems. Well, and that's why I think God is love is better than God is good. Mm-hmm. Because I'm not always good to my kids. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. They, I'm loving to them, and I love them, and I put them in time out, and then they draw angry pictures about me, you know, <laughs> and they, like, do a little happy face and a sad face and say, this is daddy. He made me sad, right? But yeah. it's for their own yeah. good. I wish you had brought some of those of pictures. Yeah. So yeah. Should, uh, from, from your children's point of view, you're not good to them. From your point of view, you are good to them. Right. Because if, 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 if you don't discipline them and, and then all of a sudden they begin thinking certain things are correct and now they begin interacting with the world with their personal point of view that says, I am the center of my universe, you have to do what I want, either they're going to get hurt or they're going to hurt people around them. Maybe not physically, maybe emotionally, maybe, maybe spiritually, but there's going to be injury that happens there. So, yeah, it's yeah. not good to them, good to you. Yeah. At, on Job, I think that mm. this idea of goodness, he is presented to us as a good and innocent person, okay? 
and his friends all gather around and basically say, no, you had to have done something wrong. Now, as Clar- believers... Clarifying, you're saying Job is presented as a good... He's presented okay. as a good person, and his friends gather around and say, no, you must have done something evil. You must have done something to deserve this. Yeah. And uh, I began yesterday by reading from Job chapter 42, where after God has confronted him, and you love the way that God says, you know dress for action like a man. And uh, so Job is standing there. And after this uh, confrontation with God, Job answers God and says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours is thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. And so I believe that first uh, point that I gave yesterday about We just are in no place to judge God. I think that's where Job is headed in all of this, is to say we just don't have the vantage point uh, to be able to fully answer all these questions. Now, I do think there are good responses to the problem of evil. In fact, I think Christianity has the most powerful response to the question of evil. But before we even get into all of that, that's why I had that as my first reason, we need to step back for a moment and realize that this universe in its vastness and its complexity is really too much for us to handle on, just look at some other levels, scientific, uh, some of these other uh, levels that we look into, there's so much complexity, so much we don't know, we're ignorant of so much, and I think skeptics would agree with us on this, that man, it's fascinating, there's so much to discover, so much to learn, but what makes us think when suddenly we move disciplines from science to morality, that now we're superior. Now we've got everything figured out. Now uh, we look at God and shake our fists and say, who are you to allow all of this to happen? When pretty much it amounts to us uh, drawing angry pictures of God, uh, not understanding his kindness and his love to us uh, that he presents throughout the pages of Scripture. And of course, that's not the only reason I gave uh, four others. But I think that for me, it puts everything in perspective in terms of understanding uh, the complexity of this question and the justice of God. Why would we think that morality and the justice and goodness and loving kindness of God be simpler than the complexity of this universe, scientifically And speaking? I like how you talked about knowledge and what does that mean. It's not just a bunch of information from a book, but it's about learning to trust. I mean, my kids trust me because they have learned that I care for them. So even when I punish them, it's not because I'm just a mean dad. And I think at some level they understand it. And I think for us, we have to learn to trust God through our circumstances, through our trials. And and I think that builds a stronger faith, as, as you mentioned in your sermon. And, and what, what kind of a universe would we think would be more desirable, more preferable? One where Everything that uh, we think or do is determined in a fatalistic sense by God uh, to where, you know, we are, in effect, robots. Uh, I I don't think anybody would prefer that kind of a world. I think we'd prefer a world where there is love, there is choice to do good or evil, uh, and the constant consequences thereof. And why should uh, the fact that somebody is going to rebel against God keep millions from trusting in God and receiving His grace and spending eternity in heaven? So, Well, I think it's interesting. One of, one of, the, one of the things that kept revolving in my head, uh, you know, there's, there's this question that, that we don't have time to answer. We, I don't know if we're going to try to get into it, but you know, there's a question is, okay, does God cause suffering? Does He cause these things? Or does he allow them and use them? Uh, in my mind, now, that may seem, seem like the same question. But in my mind, I feel like that's different questions. Um, and, and, and I think it's probably there, there is some, uh, it, this may be one of those, those both and type questions um, sure. at times. But uh, for me, I think it's one of the things that people struggle with. And, and maybe I, I, I've grown up in church. I've, I've, grown up, I've been a Christian since I was eight years old. Um, and so... My thought process can be a little bit different. I've grown up believing that there was a God. I've grown up believing that God is good, that he loves me, that, that he does things for my good. And, and so I have a hard time putting myself in a mindset that, that does not do that. But at times when I talk to non-believers, one of the things that I think that they struggle with is they struggle with those two questions. Is they struggle with, um, does God cause evil 
Like, like, is there bad things in the world because God does it and God is an angry kid with a magnifying glass who's just using the magnifying glass to, glass to, to burn ants? Or is he just complacent? Is he, is, he, is he a deity that sits back and just goes, go for it, do it? Is, is he the kid with the ant farm that just watches the ants and there's one ant killing all these others and he almost thinks it's cool? It's like, oh, look at that ant, that's awesome. And I think that there is, that, that, that there are times that, that we, we can look at that, that we can say that. And, and I think the, the easiest one, you brought it up yesterday, Romans 8, 28, um, is that, you know, God uses all, things, or uses all things for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose, is that God, even in the worst of circumstances, uses what's going on. He uses these circumstances and, and he molds them and shifts them. And, and so it goes back to your argument of, of who are we to judge? Because we don't have the scope. We don't have the perspective. We don't know how something that happens uh, 150 years ago is going gonna, is gonna to affect 25 years from now. And it, and it may have an a, a f- effect that goes down the line. I mean, we, we look at it and, and um, 9-11, uh, as, as bad as something that has happened on U.S. soil as I think any of us can remember and maybe ever, um, that uh, you go back and have you, I don't know if you guys ever read it, have you read all the stories about how empty some of these planes were? N- not to say that people didn't die, not to say there wasn't horrible times, but, but things happening that there were just masses of people that couldn't get on these planes, that there were traffic jams that prevented people from getting into the buildings. doesn't mean that people didn't still get hurt, but it does mean that there were people who were affected in a way that, that there were circumstances that prevented some of these things. And there are so many good things that have come from that. I don't think God caused it. I don't think God is the one that sent airplanes to, to crash into the towers. But I think that in that evil, in that moment of, of man's free will causing them to do evil to other people, I think God is able to, to use that and adjust that. And I know that that can get to be a hot-button topic especially because I think, I think at times we just want to go, why don't you just put your hand there and just stop it? No. Um, but I think, I think we've seen and I think Scripture has shown that, that, that free will, in my, at least in my belief, um, I know I'm talking like crazy in this one. I try to let you guys know. Well, but, but free will, in, in, in my belief, free will is, is, is not God always intervening at every single moment because of some of the things that follow, because of the scope that we can't see. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I, th- I think that, I mean, he could put us in a cage and say, well, you're free to do whatever you want to as long as you're in this cage and you won't get hurt, you won't hurt yourself. But uh, I, I do think he gives us genuine uh, free will. Not to say that there's not bondage to sin and that we're not affected by that. We certainly are. I think that we're misaligned in uh, the way that we go. Uh, And I think that God does restrain. uh, I think things could be much worse than they are. You know, I think if it were not for God's grace, this world could look much differently than it does right now. It's only by God's grace, only by his good gifts and mercies that we see the kind of world that we have today. But you look around the world and there's a ton of good. And, you know, as I reflect on my own life uh, as one who is saved, as one who is a follower of Jesus Christ and has been born again, I think to myself, you know, there's no bad that could happen to me that would even touch, uh, even begin to outweigh uh, the grace of God. His grace is sufficient. And, uh, and certainly you look at the one who suffered perhaps as much as anybody ever has, and that's Jesus of Nazareth, and he did it out of love for us. So, you know, I, for me, the answer that Christianity provides is so compelling because, uh, number one, uh, our God is infinitely great, and, and so we, we're not even in a, at a vantage point to be able to handle the truth of how all of this justice works itself out. Uh, Second, we know that whatever suffering we do go through serves a purpose, often that purpose being to move us to God. And we see that play out in history where uh, there's conversion because of suffering. You know, God puts the gospel in the hearts of people and they proclaim that gospel. And even in the midst of suffering, they realize that this is their hope and they turn to God in, in faith. And then beyond all of that, we know that on Christianity, we have a Savior and a God who understands, who empathizes with us, who uh, sympathizes with us in our weakness because he bore our griefs and our sorrows. It's not like he's just sitting up in heaven giving us a philosophy of how to handle the suffering. He came and dealt with it himself and bore our grief and our sorrow. And beyond all of that, you know, once we go to glory and we've been there thousands of years, we're not even going to remember 
the suffering of this life. It's going to be considered light and momentary compared to the eternal weight of glory that awaits us. So for me, as a Christian, believing that that's true, that is very, that's a very compelling answer to the problem of evil and suffering. So no, I can't do all the math and figure out how everything works out and the bone cancer and, and stuff like this. I, I can't figure all that out. What I can say is uh, that Christianity provides the absolute best response and answer to that question on the problem of evil. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was going to say is if you take religion out completely and you argue only philosophically, they come up with the same question. Are, am I determined? I don't know, you know, and they, they, they you know, because am I predispos- you know, disposed to this? I was born in America, therefore I act the way I do because I'm an American and I'm not, you know. And so they, they have the same philosophical con- questions and confusion. I think that they try to throw on Christianity as a uniquely religious issue when it's not. I mean, it's a universal human question. It's, am I determined? Just because I was born in America, does that make me a Christian? Or does that make, you know, and say a Muslim who never hears Christ? And, and the thing is, the question I ask is actually, I'm not going to say it's not a question that's asked or addressed at all in the Bible. It is. Sure. But really the question that the Bible deals with is, what is God doing about evil? Yes. You know, that's the question that the Bible's dealing with. Okay, there is evil in the world. They didn't have a logical issue with God's existence and the existence of evil and suffering. The question for them and that the Bible seeks to address over and over is what's God doing about it? And we see a couple of different things. One, of course, Jesus comes and deals with it himself. But secondly, it says that we are created for good works. We're created to go out and extend the mercies of God and his grace and love and go into those broken places in the world and bring healing and restoration. God is working through us to uh, bring healing to the world. And so that's what God is doing about evil. When it, it just hit me. You bring that up. It, it's interesting. When we ask this question, when, when we find a stumbling block in the, in the form of suffering and evil, um, it's the same stumbling block that block the Jews had over Jesus Christ. What are you doing about it? Yeah, like what, yeah. like you're, you're right. Is that, they're like, wait, wait, if you're the king, take up your sword. Here's yeah. your horse. Let's right. go to battle. Yeah. Free us. Free us from, from, violence, from yeah. this has happened for, you know, we, we've been under oppression for thousands of years. Why don't, it's, this, it's the same thing. And you're right, though, is, is it's, a, it's a shift in viewpoint. It's yeah. what he is doing something. He was doing something. He's working in us. He's working in our hearts. He's working. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, a police officer. I'm not a military guy. And, and, and there, are even, there are even things that restrain police officers and military guys. You can't just go and kick down a door of a guy you know to be a bad guy and just shoot him. Um, you, know, you have to follow certain orders, certain things. But yet he is creating things in us to, to, to do that. You know, and so you, you come around. It's great that you, you talked about the, 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 uh, um, the folks of Christianity uh, because before we started, you know, I was playing a little bit of devil's advocate, you know, and I asked you, I asked you if, if your first point of, of who, what position, or am I in a position to judge God, and your last point of I'm awaiting incomparable glory, those sound like cop-outs. Mm-hmm. I, I, I said that, and, and, and it was interesting because now that we begin to talk about it, and they're, we get around to it, we come full circle, they're not cop-outs because one of the major points of Christianity is that God is holy and separate. That God, that, that it, one of my professors, I, I love him to death, he's, he's incredible, uh, Jeff Bingham, that, that he says that there is, there is God and there is everything else. Yeah. And, and, and that's the way that it is. There's mm-hmm. God and there's everything else. And, and it's one of the things about, that Christianity makes such a big deal about is there is God and then there's me, there's you, there's earth, there's animal. It's in a different category altogether. Yeah. And so when we do that, when we elevate God, when Christianity gives the answer of elevating God and of making much of God, then your first and fifth point, they're not cop-outs. Yeah. They, they, they're simply pointing towards the almighty, holy, wonderful, loving, good creator. Yeah. And part of a sermon, I mean, he's... you're. Jared's preaching not just to skeptics or not just yeah. to believers. You know, he's, he's preaching to everybody. And so you have to balance. I mean, oh, yeah. if he came up here and just, you know, did Kalam's argument and this and that and did all these arguments, how would we really be fed? You know, so he, I, th- I think that in Jared's preparation, it hit a good, you know, medium. Like, that. Yeah, some stuff is good for the skeptic and some is good for us that are sitting in the pew and I think it's important that we're reminded, you know, about the fact that we serve a slain Savior, that we 
are strengthened in our suffering and, and stuff like that. It may not be a comfort to say an atheist who's watching and says, you know, oh, well, that sounds like a cop out. You know, why would God have an eternal hell if, mm-hmm. if he's good? You know, but for us as believers, that's also a comfort. So I, th- I think there's, we're at different starting points when oh, yeah. we're listening to what is preached to us. And I think how we move forward depends a lot on what we're getting. I, yeah. I don't yeah. know if I'm no, making you, myself you, clear. But you're saying but. it right. You're saying it perfectly, though. Is that, that there's? I mean, yeah, well, I don't understand any of that, man. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, understand yeah. half of what I say. So, but. <laughs> you know what were there? I, I, maybe 300 people in this room on Sunday, yeah. plus you know uh, several several people watching online. We all come from different points of view. You know, I sit there with my wife. We live in the same house, and we hear things differently because we have different points of view. How much am I going to have a different point of view from someone who, has show, who shares nothing in common with me? You know, the only reason that all of us sit in one room together at one time is because of Christ. Yeah. That's why. He is the thing that binds us and bonds us, and, and we are so different, and so it is. And I think that's one of the things that, that people, people who are overly critical of preachers at times, they don't always understand, is that just because you don't feel necessarily fed by the sermon doesn't mean that the person literally sitting right next to you did, was not amazingly affected. You know, Jared says it all the time. He says that there, there are sermons that he feels like he just nails and nobody says a word to him. Um, and I say he, I, yeah. I've gone through this too. You, right. You've probably done this too. Um, but then there are ones that, that you finish and you walk off and you just go, wow, boy, I really tanked on that one. And you have somebody walk down the aisle just in tears talking about how moving it was. Yeah. Um, because we do all come from different, different uh, uh, starting points. And, and so it is. When you preach a sermon about this, uh, it literally could be a four-hour sermon and still not cover the whole topic. And, yeah. it's, not, and it's not about us either. And, yeah. and just to be clear, I mean, God's word does not return void. I mean, right. a lot of it's God working through the, you know, the proclamation of his word. So, you know, just because you feel like right at that moment you're not fed, yeah. you know, 30 minutes down the road you may get into a car accident and your whole life falls apart and you're like, man, I'm glad I had that sermon 10 minutes ago because... Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and that's kind of one of the reasons why these last two sermons, I did something I normally don't do, and I, I gave personal reasons, mm-hmm. you know. And so, and I think every reason that I gave could be true of anybody, okay? Anybody sitting out there could realize that, hey, I am here to know God. Uh, I have uh, uh, incomparable glory awaiting me. Uh, and... God loves me. He, I have a relationship with him that surpasses in worth anything else in life. That can be true of every single person sitting out there in the congregation. And so the question is, well, why not? Well, it's because we, as we read last week, we suppress the truth. We push against that for whatever reasons. We'll come up with a million different excuses. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago we talked about doubt. And talked about, you know, doubt uh, is not a virtue. It's not necessarily good. But in, in its place, it can be helpful and God can use doubt. But uh, we also said, you know, Tim Keller said, doubt your doubts. And so we can always come up with a, well, but what if this? And what if this? And keep pushing back. But the, the compelling nature of all, this, all of this for me is we gave arguments a couple of weeks ago uh, for the existence of God, to show just on the arguments alone, it's more probable than not that God exists. And then yesterday we dealt with what is often raised as an objection, but we see right off the bat it's really not an objection at all. The, the question is, okay, well, how do we reconcile the goodness of God and suffering and evil? It's not really ultimately, I don't think, a good argument to say that God doesn't exist. And that an atheist would have to come up with that and present that. But... Um, at some point, you begin to wonder, okay, why, why are you still doubting? Like, what are you doubting about all of this? And uh, so I, I just think that uh, this could be true of any single person who wants to receive uh, Christ as Savior, where they could um, stop resisting, uh, look at the truth uh, that's laid out before us, and especially what we're going to talk about this coming Sunday on the resurrection of, of, um, of Christ, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and look into that. And I think that uh, for me, all of that points us to a loving, powerful God who created everything. So, Before we close, let me ask one practical question that one of the listeners has brought up. Um, answer it as quickly as you can because I know we're running low on time. No, here, we're, good. Sure. we're good. We've got um, all the time in the world. <laughs> Jonathan Talfuse asked, what should we do as believers to help people in going through hard times? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to modify the question a little bit. So, could, Jared, could you answer 
for other believers, and could you answer for unbelievers? Okay. So, what can a believer do to help a believer going through hard times, and what can a believer do to help an unbeliever going through hard times? Well, I honestly think that there's one answer uh, in many ways. I think, of course, as believers, there's more that we are set up to be able to do. Uh, but as I said in week one, love is the ultimate apologetic. We are to love that person and to care about that person. And that, that experience is going to speak more powerfully than any arguments or any uh, truths or reasons that we can give. It's simply through following the example of Jesus who cared for people, who served people, who provided a powerful example of uh, the love of God. And so I would say to love the person and to share the gospel. And well, well, what would it look like? I mean, can you just give like an example? I mean, I know I'm drawing the question out even longer, but I mean, just hearing that, I'm like, okay, that sounds great. Yeah, be with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what does it look like? What, like, Give me a couple steps. I think I, I think I would say sure. this, and 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 I know I know we're kind of we're kind of convoluting your question, but sure. I think Jared hit on it. Is is I think it should look very similar uh, both ways. Now now the basis of the conversations may be a little bit different when whether you're talking to a believer versus an unbeliever based on backgrounds where they're coming from. But um, I think the first one is be present. Mm-hmm. Is be present in 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 the same way that that. Um, that Christ was, was present for so many of the, the ways that he healed people, the ways that he helped people, um, and, and so just being there. But also not just being there, but speaking life into them. Um, now, we've all heard the analogy that sometimes it's better just to, 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 to suffer with someone as opposed to always trying to give them uh, some anecdote or something like that. You know, uh, it, it, does no, it, it doesn't help many people um, when their child dies to put your arm around them and say, God just need another angel in heaven. Yeah. Um, but, but to, to speak life, to speak love, to, you know, I think Paul says to be Christ to that person. Because if they don't, for a non-believer, if they don't have Christ in their life, um, that they're not going to have that, that, uh, um, that peace. They're not going to have that part of their mind that is calm, that is comforted, that, that there is a hope for the future. And so just to, to be Christ for that person, to, to not, that, not that we can be, but right. that we do our best um, in them to, uh, to be present. How much does being present just help uh, um, that in, in a time of suffering? Maybe it's not even death. Maybe it's a loss of a job. Maybe it's just being around them. Um, and I think those are the things is, is to, to be Christ and to speak that life that Christ spoke into other people, to speak that into them, whether it's truth. Uh, whether it's, it's uh, truth and love, whether it, 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 it's words of comfort, however that plays out. I, I, my, my thing, I would add just a caution. Yeah, be with them, but don't have to answer all their questions. Right. Yeah. You know, a lot of times when someone is in the midst of suffering, they don't want real answers. They just need to suffer. And suffer with them. I mean, cry with them. Just, you know, Jesus wept mm-hmm. when others wept. He came down from yeah. he came down from heaven and condescended just to be with us, which I think is exactly what you guys are saying, and to suffer with us. Right. And I think we can do no better than Christ right. in in that respect. And so I think just a caution on having all the answers, sure. and don't give bumper bumper sticker theology. You know, right. like you said, another angel in heaven or so. I mean, if I wasn't suffering and someone said that, I'd probably punch them because I'd be like, that's really hurtful, right? Yeah. So don't be glib. Just suffer feel it with them yeah. i mean how it's not bad to suffer with that person yeah. right absolutely well ladies and gentlemen uh thank you for being with us what a weighty topic um something that that uh we deal with often uh everybody in our office in our churches um and, and it's difficult it, it's one of those things that uh when, when we look in first peter and we have to give the hope that we have within us uh, that, that those are the things that we, we stumble upon. Those are the things that we can struggle with. And, and I know that we may not have answered every single question that you've ever come up with today, but uh, uh, hopefully what we've done is we've given you a little bit of hope. Maybe we've given you a starting point. Um, if you have any more questions, please email me, kyle at tvbc.net. Uh, I would love to either do my best to answer the question or forward it on to someone that I think could. Uh, but once again, we thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope that we brought a little bit of hope and encouragement into your life, uh, if not just a little bit of discussion and maybe laughter. 
Uh, please join us next week, uh, Monday at 12 o'clock. We'll be discussing Jared's next sermon on the resurrection of Christ. Uh, and Jared will be preaching next Sunday right here at Taylor's Valley Baptist Church at 1030 a.m. We'd love to have you join us. We've got our life group Sunday starting at 915. Please come. We'll have plenty of people to direct you where you can go. Uh, and, and we'd love to have you come, uh, talk to us, enjoy a little bit of fellowship with us, and then come in and just have a great time of worship. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, we thank you so much for joining us. I uh, hope you have a great day, and I look forward to seeing you this week.